Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Season 3 of the Audiobook Club with John York, a podcast celebrating every aspect of audiobook production and the surrounding industry. The Audiobook Club is sponsored by Amplify Audiobooks by Pro Audio Voices. To hear more about the phenomenal movements Amplify Audiobooks is making for independent authors in the audiobook space, you can find a direct link in the bio of this episode, as well as a short but informative advertisement within this interview. Let's start the show. Hello and welcome to the Audiobook Club. In this week's episode, we're so lucky to be joined once again by an audiobook narrator that everybody is talking about, Andre Santana. Thank you so much for joining me. As I say, once again on the show, how are you, my friend? Thanks for having me back. I'm doing well, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Did you have a nice new year? Did you do any celebrating? Yeah, I had a friend from college who just had like a little get together at their apartment. So it was it was a nice chill new year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. fantastic. Well, since your last appearance uh, on the show, uh, you have transitioned full time into narration and voice acting. So um, I believe I know it came about a little sooner than may have been expecting uh, originally. Could you tell us a little about that time and, and, and what your life was like at, at, at that point during that transition? Yeah, absolutely. It was so fascinating because I I had amazing supervisors um, at my last job and they I, I told them the entire time about my audiobook work and mm-hmm. wanting to transition out eventually and they were really supportive. Mm-hmm. And I had just come, I, I was working for uh, uh, an organization that was on a school calendar. So we had just come off of winter break and I'd gotten these two requests back to back for me to audition for like 24 hour long books. And working full time, I felt like it, it felt really transparent that that wouldn't really be feasible um, to be able to do something like that in a reasonable time while still working nine to five, 40 hours a week. And so I started the conversation like the first business day of January 2023 with my immediate supervisor. And I was like, hey, listen, I'm I think April I'm going to be ready to go part time here so that I can take on more work in audiobooks. Um, And she was super excited. We kind of like made a plan. We set out like what our checkpoints were going to be. And then two weeks later, 30% of the company got laid off. And I, they, they were very nice about it. We got like a couple months of severance um, and they gave us like a two week notice. So we still got a paycheck Mm -hmm. and then severance. Um, But February 1st, 2023, I was just like, Mm-hmm. we're out here we're doing this this is it now <laughs> uh and it's um it's really interesting i i was just doing some reach outs to producers and part of that for me is going back and like seeing what i've you know emailed them before um and i think i'd done like 50 books around this time last year um and had just uh you know w- when my job ended like the very first thing that happened was going to this um, like conference that I had booked like months in advance and it felt so backwards to like lose my main source of income and then like go on vacation immediately after. Um, but I felt there, there was a, a kind of, I don't know how else to describe it except to say that months later when I would tell people how this happened, almost unanimously, every single person I told the story to would say, well, the universe thought you were ready. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And I guess that's I I I can really only guess that's as much of what it was. Um so it has been a whirlwind year. Uh yeah. it, it's it's a year, you know, we're recording this on January 29th. It's it'll be a year on February 1st. Um so it's it's been a whirlwind year. Yeah. 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 It's it's incredible. So this was la- so this was last year, the start of last mm-hmm. year. Did you have the Audi nomination by that point? No, I I yeah, I came back from that vacation and a couple of weeks later I heard about the audio nomination. <laughs> well, I have to agree with those people telling you that the universe was telling you something. Because that, <laughs> that is... So speaking about that audio nomination, I believe it was it wasn't the last time I saw you. I believe it was the second last second to last time that I saw you was at the Audis. Mm-hmm. And seeing you there you know, dressed to the nines, looking amazing, all of this, you know, there was a buzz around you. I just kind of want to ask you, like, what was it like around that time? Because it's an incredible event. Um, yeah. But to to be that, I mean, did it feel 
did it feel that special to you? Were you just sort of swept up in it, or was it just a just a just an average Monday? <laughs> oh my, it was it was absolutely fantastic, especially because for anyone who was present at APAC right before the Audis, um Audio Publishers Association conference, it was essentially for a lot of people the very first time they'd been physically present in a room with people from the audiobook industry, um, and I had you know I'd been into a studio a couple times. There had been some small get togethers. I had made friends with some New York folks, but the energy of APAC started at a 10 and then it just stayed at a 10 all the way through the audience, I think. Um, And it was so fun to just be, have an excuse to get dressed up for one. Um, (laughs) But I think to like show up in a celebratory space and to know that like everybody is excited to be there and that like there's a there's a shared thing that's happening here i feel like i i I, you know i think a lot of people go to comic-con they go to these kind of like big public events where there is a shared sense of purpose and i Mm -hmm. haven't really attended a ton of those in my life Mm -hmm. um and so i kept i kept joking to people in the lead up to like apac and the audience last year that it would be my woodstock my personal like audiobook (laughs) industry woodstock but it was a blast it was absolutely a blast yeah, I have to agree with you. It was so nice being. I, I mean, I I can't tell you when I was last in a room with that many people. Um, you know, riding, you know, just out of COVID, and then to, and and also all of those people being people that you actually want to see. Yes, <laughs> you know, it was. It, yeah. it was. It was incredible. Mm-hmm. Now I don't know. I have this idea of you. So mm-hmm. please do correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> I think it's because. Because I keep seeing you at, at networking events or, you know, you know, just out and about with other narrators and things in New York, in other places. And I have this idea of you. You are a phenomenal networker. Everybody knows and loves you. I'm not going to ask you if <laughs> I'm not going to ask you if you are a phenomenal networker. But is it something that you do take pride in? You do want to get out there as often? Because as we all know, it's it, audiobook narration can be lonesome in some ways yeah you know yeah. so is that something that is on your mind looking for networking events looking for things to get out and connect with people yeah 100 percent. i think about this all the time um for me there's like a few different levels to it um like i, I there are to me there are also like networking superstars i look up to like i love um jennifer aquino i feel like yeah. she's working with everybody i love her approach um i think that for me, there's like a drive to kind of understand who the people are around us. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like there are a lot of narrators who I've listened to them narrate, and I just wanted an opportunity to be like, hey, just wanted to let you know, like, that was amazing work. Like, I'm not in you know, an industry professional with kind of like my word, it doesn't have stake for you, but I just wanted to let you know because your performance touched me. And I think that like, that's part of the approach is just wanting to connect with people and be able to like share that feedback that I'm buzzing around with. Like, I love this thing you made. And I think the other part too is I feel like there's always personalities that I really appreciate. There's something about the audiobook industry where it really just is a lot of people that you do want to get to know, like a lot of people that you do want to connect with. Um, and I feel I'm I feel grateful that I am in those contexts, like extroverted and that I'm like interested in going out into the crowd and like stumbling into a random conversation with someone and uh, kind of rolling from there. And then I think the other piece, too, is like, you know, before before this, uh, my last job, I was a recruiter. And as a recruiter, there are a lot of contexts um, because I specialized in events in particular. So I was literally physically showing up and I was a gatekeeper in a lot of ways. There were people who wanted to connect with me. And I felt like there were people who connected with me in ways that like completely was not about me and i didn't fault them for it i know that it was the process we all want work and i want to give you a job so like let's do it um but i feel like that's driven a lot of my approach like connecting with um like producers and other uh you know professionals in the audiobook industry too is that like yes like you could give me a job but also like i'm super fascinated by the pottery you're doing or Mm -hmm. like I also read that book or you produced this book I just loved and I want to tell you that I loved it or whatever it is. And I feel like I'm 
just interested in those ways to to connect and for that to be like as human a connection as mm -hmm. possible. Um, but I, I guess that's that's just a little seed of who I've always been that happens to blossom in a space like this where it's kind of easy to get in touch with everybody and find everybody and, and make friends everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, amazing. It's like I, said, I think it's an interesting conversation because I, I've spoken with narrators who um, it, it was all around like the APAC, and they would um, tell me that you know this was their first event. Maybe the, you know maybe they were quite early on in their audiobook narration career, and the opportunity to go and, and chat with people who could potentially give them really cool projects and things, they were feeling quite overwhelmed and sort of taking the the human out of the equation and thinking, well, if I don't say the perfect thing, I could blow this. They're going to think I'm an idiot or they're going to think I'm crap at it or, or however. Um, and I think it's, I think it's really interesting that you look at that of, of, of being honest and being, to, you know, remembering that there is a human behind <laughs> the esteem of, of, of the producer label. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember one of my favorite conversations that I had, like in the lead up to APAC and the Audis, someone was like, I'm super introverted. I'm not going to be out here like wandering the, you know, the crowds looking for conversation. I'm going to like find a chair. I'm going to post up in a corner and I'm just kind of like going to hold court there. Yeah. And it was great because a ton of other people who were very similar came into that comment, like on a Facebook post and were like, oh, I'd love to join you there because that sounds, <laughs> that sounds great to me. And it's like, yes, like we have these similarities. We have these moments. Yeah. And I, I think that's, that's exactly it is like mm -hmm. you show up in a way that brings you joy, in a way that feels authentic to you, and the people who are going to find you are going to find you, you know? Mm, yeah, absolutely. So I know that being a full-time narrator and voice actor is a goal for so many people who listen to this show. So I just kind of wondered, this may be a, a, a difficult question to throw at you, so I do apologise, but have you any thoughts, you know, maybe perhaps um, unexpected hurdles or challenges that you faced since making this transition full-time uh, that you, you know, that you maybe were unforeseen uh, that yeah. someone who is hoping to make that transition, um, you know, soon should maybe be aware of. Yeah. Two big things. One is um, being freelancers, we don't get regular paychecks. Mm -hmm. And there would be days where I'm like, okay, I'm actually, I'm booking a really healthy volume of work. The amount of money that I made is very satisfactory and I have none of it in my hands. Like none of the payments have come through. And I'm like, there's like $10 left in my account. And like, you know, however many, like waiting to be invoiced or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and that was really hard. Uh, I, so for so long, there were people who would talk to me about how they like budget in quarters and they always need to have like one quarter's worth of money set aside in order to like not freak out like that. Yeah. Um, and I'm, you know, even when I did have a steady paycheck, I was not fantastic with money and I'm still not fantastic with money. But I think that's been a challenge is like figuring out how to have a healthy financial life as a freelancer where it's all project based gigs. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing, one thing that I'm personally really navigating and this ties back to that wanting to connect with people, too, is for me getting recording alone at home has gotten harder and harder. And as often as it's available, I ask for a director or I ask to be put in studio and even just the process of someone else showing up, mm -hmm. I'm like three times more efficient. I feel the process is more joyful. I feel like I can focus more on my craft as the narrator. Mm -hmm. um, and it also feels, you know, I'm sitting at my desk right now. My booth is immediately behind me and my bed is to my to my left. So it's like, getting me out of this space puts me in a healthier mindset, like giving me a process. And so I think those two things really tie together as like the, I guess the, the, the day-to-day -day components of what makes your financial health and your mental health like mm. sustainable. Um, so I think those have been the two things that have, that I've really been navigating uh, over the course of this year. Mm -hmm. I really resonate with both of those. Um, and I think the idea, so the first one about things that you can do, because I, I think like the uncertainty, I mean, uncertainty really, 
is mostly financial, right? It, like the, the fear around uncertainty is mostly uh, mostly financial. So I think that sometimes, you know, we can get told, well, that's just this life and you better harsh up to it. And, oh, you know, you're going to, you're not, you're not cut out for this. But I do think it's, it's an interesting conversation of, okay, yeah, that is predominantly, you know, you're not going to get paid, you know, every fourth Friday or whatever, but there are things that you can do financially. But I think that's just a really interesting conversation to have that yet, yes, you, you will always have that level of uncertainty, but it doesn't have to be as harsh as it is left to your own devices. Um, and the second point there, super resonate with it. My bed's in the next room. So I get out of the booth and I go lay down and I have to force myself to get back <laughs> to get, yes. to get yes. back up. <laughs> So when you're in the so when you're in those directed sessions, do you think it's that accountability? Do you? I mean, obviously you can't go and lay, lay in bed when you have a director. Like, but is it that? Do you think it is that accountability and also the fact that it is it is more fun just working, you know, in, in collaboration with other people? Yeah, I think it's. I think for sure it's the accountability. For me, it's also partially this. Like I have someone who is. You know, when I have a director that I really feel like a synergy with, it feels like I'm almost working with, uh, how would I say it? Someone who's in support of my performance and is like hyping me up when the hype's like merited and is supporting me if I need to take a break and is like helping me catch, you know, the mistakes as we're punching and rolling or whatever it is. And I think just having that kind of support makes a tremendous difference in terms of like what I can focus on. Um, Cause I think, you know, when it's just us in the booth, like we are the director catching mistakes as we go or re approaching a piece of dialogue or, you know, a performance choice. We're also the engineer who's like going back and punching back into the audio. Um, and then simultaneously, we are the person who, you know, unofficially, uh, it, it feels less deliberate for me to say, like, oh, I'm going to record by myself from nine to four, um, and I'm just going to be in my booth here. Mm -hmm. I feel like if I do that alone, an email comes in, a task is needed, I got to go down the street to do something. Um, it feels like there's a there's a really clear wall of, like, we're at work, we're really doing the work mm -hmm. when there's someone else whose time is also on the line. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I know a lot of people who I think struggle working with directors. If they're not full time, it's hard to write, just like get those days scheduled. Yeah. Um, there are people with uh, like uh, chronic illness or neurodiverse challenges in terms of like just sitting for that amount of time. I think like that type of stamina isn't an inherent, mm -hmm. you know, aspect of uh, of a narrator. Um, and so it's, there's a lot of components to it and it's different for everybody, but I think that the journey is identifying what you need mm -hmm. and making sure that you get it so you can do your best work. Yeah, absolutely. So where are you, where are you on that line? Are you, are you one who, who can have long sessions in that booth or, or do you need to take regular breaks? Could you, could you let us know like maybe your, your, your typical process when working from home? Yeah. So it depends. Um, from home, if I'm alone, I really prefer to like, you know, if there's time and there's space to do like shorter spurts, um, maybe four hours in the booth a day or something along those lines, if there isn't really a rush. Um, when I'm working with a director or in the studio, it's much easier to do like three to three and a half finished hours a day, for example. Mm. Um, but I think it depends on the project. It depends on everybody's scheduling. Mm. Um, I, I just, just did my longest book, uh, in December. It was 18 hours and thankfully it was both in studio and with a director. So we had, we had like a team of three the entire way through. Um, and that for one was very like a North star experience. That's like something that I, I, I really want to return to as often as possible. Um, but two, I realized we, uh, we, I usually go when I'm in studio from like 10 to four, mm -hmm. we did go every day from 10 to five. And I didn't think that hour would be super significant, but it mm -hmm. did start to like hurt my voice a little bit, just that hour, um, mm -hmm. across the course of six days. So I think even knowing like, now I know that's my limit, you know, 10 to five, one day. Sure. We can, we can pull it together but i i think just like identifying how it works as as you go mm -hmm. through yeah 
Yeah. So when you're when you're in those long sets, because they're, they're pretty. I mean, three and a half finished hours um, is you know a lot of talking. Uh, espe- you know, especially in uh, you know consistently for, for for days and days and days on a project like that. How are you looking after your your voice? Have you any sort of tips and tricks that you can share with us um, that just make sure that you're not you know blowing out your voice uh, yeah. indoors? I am deeply not the expert on this. Um, I, I, there's so many great people. I think like, you know, like Elise Arsenault has a yeah. vocal health piece. Nick Redman does this yes. um, podcast that has amazing tips. I do, for me, I, every time I pause, uh, and if, you know, we get a chance between chapters, I like to do it then too. I keep like two warmups, uh, truly just yawns and, uh, yawns and lip trills that I'm just like doing randomly. Maybe we have to, you know, go back and punch and we've got a few seconds just like rolling out the yawns and the lip trills as often as possible um, and as much water as possible. And I think like if I, if we don't pay attention to when our voice tells us it's at the limit, then it's, we're going to hit that limit. Um, So, you know, if we have to stop early because I'm just getting, my voice is getting way too tired, we stop early or whatever it might Mm be. Um, but I think that, I think that component is huge because I feel like there were times really early on where I didn't fully understand like the impact of talking this much on your voice. Um, and I also didn't know anything about like projection and breath. And so like, I think my, my first novel I did for a publisher, um, really fun, loved my co-narrator. I did the whole thing in like a whispered voice Mm -hmm. and it was, it just wrecked my throat for like four days. Um, and I would like to do this job for a long time, hopefully yeah. for decades to come. And that isn't, you know, <laughs> using my voice in that way is not is not part of that vision. <laughs> I've been there myself. Um, I think you find that a lot of uh, romance uh, books uh, require a certain sort of type of husk to the to the to the tones and uh yeah i've i've made that i've, I've <laughs> started a character doing that and then you get about two days in and you think this is something's wrong with this <laughs> it's yes yeah i i just did a gravelly yeah gravelly voice and it you know yeah i don't i don't know what else to say about it because you're right it's <laughs> <laughs> I, did it. I was into um I myself are personally getting into a lot of a lot of yawns and a lot of sighs, uh, mm. just to, just to open up and to feel good. But I've gotten to the habit now where I do them all the time when I'm not even recording on days that I'm not recording. But I'll do it so subliminally that I'll be like I'll be answering the door to the postman and go, <gasps> like, you know, in their face, or <laughs> or be at family gatherings and just <clears throat> sigh, and everyone's like, "You okay? Do you want to go home? Or what's going on?" <laughs> Yeah, it, I love I do love the way all of this has like trickled into the rest of my life. Like yeah. I, for example, if I go to like a really loud bar or a really loud club or whatever it is, like I know not to try to yell over the music. I just get up into the person's ear and speak directly. And I'm the only one who doesn't have a sore throat when we're driving home. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So on your website, it yeah. states that Andre is a voice actor that loves a good challenge. Now, as an actor. Are you looking for challenging characters? Are you looking for challenging stories to tell? And if so, what makes a challenging project? Okay. There are a few different examples. And Mm. I think a lot of it lately that I've encountered has to do with either variety or with format. Mm -hmm. Um, There is a book I recorded last year called Dual Memory. I recorded it for Dreamscape. And the character it's a sci-fi where the character lands on this island and is very uh he's there under kind of dubious circumstances he's kind of undercover and he's really inclined to let's say adapt himself to make other people feel comfortable Mm -hmm. um and for him that literally meant whenever he heard someone speak in an accent he would replicate that accent and replicate it every time he was around them um he lands on the island and his first doctor is british he does a british accent he goes and like gets a job his supervisor is eastern european he does an eastern european accent he moves into a building and his neighbor across the hallway is russian and thankfully he does not do a russian accent but like he keeps making these choices um and on top of that 
he lives in a world where there is AI everywhere. There are robots. They all speak. Um, they're intentionally made to speak in very monotone ways. Mm -hmm. But there is one AI that is kind of his partner in the story that speaks very in very lively and reflective ways. And this character is also really artistic and thoughtful and reflective. And so this is like, there's like seven, eight layers of things to navigate throughout the course of that book. Um, and in fact, he eventually becomes friends with his doctor who says like, I know why you're really here. I met your supervisor. Um, and I had to make a choice as an actor because it wasn't in the text, like when to drop his British accent that he was replicating with mm -hmm. this doctor. And I loved that. That was a journey. That was like a process. I loved that. And so for me, that's, I think, challenge in variety. Um, there have been now a few books that have challenged me with form. I was in a, a, a multicast book in July called Tropicalia, um, one of my favorite things I've ever gotten to perform. Um, the every All the narrators did a fantastic job with that book. And every character's section is kind of written a little bit differently. And my character's section uh, doesn't have quotation marks. Um, there's uh, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, paragraph differentiations when different people speak, but sometimes it's just context. There's this one scene in the middle of the book where uh, it is two pages, no paragraph breaks, um, mostly just commas as punctuation, where he is like navigating his way through a crowd intent on murdering someone and runs into his sister and fireworks go off and the sound effects are written into the book and he suddenly stumbles upon like a, 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 a robbery. Um, all commas, no quotation marks. He's also having flashbacks to like an experience with his like ex-girlfriend. And that kind of like journey and navigation I think is incredibly fun as well to like go in and identify and play with. Um, and I just did another book called uh, The Words That Remain that was very similar. Um, but this one, just pages and pages where there's nothing but commas. You know that someone's speaking because after a comma, there's a capital. And I literally went through and I, I don't really annotate or highlight. And I went through and I annotated and I highlighted the book like He's it's a 70 year old man remembering what it was like to be 20 and 30 and 40. He's someone wrote him a letter before he learned to read. And we sometimes hear from that person. We're sometimes hearing from this man's like father when he was a child. Um, and so there's all these distinctions that are often only contextual um, that impact like the age of the voice that impact all these different pieces. Um, and that's like so fun to play with. Um, I'm glad not every single book is like that. You know, I get a break, but I feel like those those feel like, you know, I feel like um, on screen actors get these like weird characters that they're playing under a ton of makeup or, you know, they're some kind of sci fi monster. And I, th I think for me, that is is what like an acting challenge is in the context of audiobooks. Yeah, this, th th those examples sound it sound very challenging but incredibly fulfilling once yeah. like once that project is done or even just you know just just testing you as a performer um throughout all the stages of production um they sound absolutely fantastic when um you mentioned that on screen actors they get to play all these quirky characters and such are there any character traits that you you know when when looking at future projects and someone mentions you know a, a specific character trait of someone that you're going to be playing is there any that come to mind where you think you automatically think oh this one's going to be this one's going to be fun mm. i feel like there's this it's a it's it's a mix for sure um i think one that stands out is kind of like Characters who are navigating, uh, like, emotions that feel contradictory, mm. um, like grief and anger, mm -hmm. or um, characters who are navigating uh, love and regret. Um, I, I think it's like, when the writer has, like, just stepped up to home ba base and, like, whacked the ball all the way across the field and, and given something, like, really significant to chew on, I think that is fascinating. Um, 
I think the thing that's been surprising me is how often I'm finding that outside of fiction too. Mm. Um, I, for me, especially when it's written in first person, I try to approach nonfiction just like fiction. Um, and I'm finding more and more nonfiction that I think like encompasses essentially a character that is, is challenged by what they're exploring. Um, mm. But I, I guess it's I, I guess possibly more so than uh, you know being able to play a specific thing. It's it's the opportunity to play different things. You know I don't really mm. specialize in a genre. Um, I just did my kind of like year in review, and I'm doing more uh, adult content than I did middle grade and YA content the year before, um, which are still some of my favorites. Those are beautifully, intricately written, I think, more and more so every year, more than a lot of people know. Um, so I'm I'm just being surprised by where the things I love come from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Do you um, do you get affected by some of the things? Uh, you, like I've spoken to narrators and they have an amazing ability to 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 really distance themselves, like distance that version of them in the booth, and then as soon as they're out of the booth, it's out. They're onto other things. I find certain books, obviously not every book, but there'll be certain books that I that will emotionally change me, and I will not exactly, but you know, if I'm playing a character, I won't be that character outside. But it's more, I can't stop thinking about them. Just like what yeah. happens when I read them, you know, perfectly as, you know, for pleasure as a as a reader. Um, how how are you with things like that? Do you find yourself coming away sometimes unable to shake some of the content? It's it's a mix. Um, there There's really positive stuff all mm. the time where I feel like I've read a book and I'm like, had I not been the narrator of this book, I would have loved this book or like mm. i wish i had the chance to read this book when i was 16 mm. or what be it um there was one book in particular a uh, horror novel everything the darkness eats by eric laraca and um for anyone who's read it or even just read anything else that author writes there were a couple scenes in there where i had to like finish the chapter and get out of the booth and just like take a walk and just pause um some really intense stuff in there um, that was like really well woven into the story. And I think like, I think it does hit. Um, I feel like I, regardless of what I'm doing, I feel like I and a lot of actors, you know, the approach that we're taking is we are becoming the character. We're settling into the story. We are performing essentially the emotional consequences of whatever is happening in the story. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's hard to, you know, perform a really brutal scene without feeling or like really visualizing or imagining what's happening there. Um, I don't think anything, thankfully nothing has like left me traumatized. <laughs> um, I don't imagine that I'm doing much work in a space, you know, <laughs> where there's going to be something on my plate that like leaves me completely shaken and unable to recover. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I like being, I, I like, I like leaving a story and being like, wow, like I can't wait for literally, whether they read read the book or listen to the audiobook, I can't wait for literally anybody else to read this so we can talk about it. Like I'm, <laughs> what what a what an impression this has left on me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I'm like that with um, if a character. There's a uh, author, Reese Lawless, who I've worked with many times, but he writes the most amazing, sassiest characters, mm. and the comebacks. I've never known anything like it, and I find myself coming out days later. I'd be like, oh, "What would that character do? What would Reese write for me to say right now <laughs> in a confrontational situation in real life?" And you're thinking, "What? What would <laughs> what uh, would Reese write for me to say now?" <laughs> I love that. That, that sticks with me. That. <laughs> that sticks with me. Um, narrators um, getting more involved in marketing for their projects and of their services on TikTok and Instagram, you know, doing live narrations, etc. is something that we're seeing a lot more of these days. Mm. Do you think there is a pressure for narrators to make more of an effort with those things, you know, to make vlogs, to make videos, to engage with listeners more frequently? Do you, are you finding that at the moment? Yeah, absolutely. I think so. I I feel like there's um, kind of this back and forth of like, you don't need to do social media. You don't have to be making all these things. And then this opposing message of like, 
why haven't you put out three posts this week? Like, why mm -hmm. don't you have, you know, five different social media accounts? Are you on Blue Sky yet? Like all these different pieces that keep coming up. Um, I was able to do a, a, a workshop for um, PANA, for the Professional Audiobook Narratives Association. And I feel like when I talk about this, like, I talk to folks about like, okay, you have this goal. So here's, you know, a couple of ways we can approach it. Mm. But I feel like ultimately the important thing is that you not have an expectation on your plate that is going to bring you dread and anxiety constantly. Mm. Right. Um, I think that there are a lot of um, narrators who, for example, feel that they like have to be posting a couple times a week on social media. And so they're going in and they're going to make content. And then a lot of that content is structured to engage other narrators, right? It's inside content that is really about community building. Um, and that's beautiful. And the anxiety that they're carrying about having to do that is because they're expecting that content to generate leads, to get them on the radar of authors, to connect them with producers. And so I think that kind of specificity is important, mm. but ultimately to remember, like, you know, there are working narrators whose email addresses I cannot find online. There are working narrators who don't have social media. Um, you know, for someone breaking in right now, I think there's a lot that you can do to be discoverable. Um, and for someone who's working right now, I think that there's plenty you can do to get your name out because it has an impact uh, in a lot of ways. I know, uh, you know, there are folks who are really successful on TikTok who talk about that success being the reason that they, uh, you know, have authors requesting them. And so mm -hmm. the author, the more, more projects might come directly to them. Um, but it also is not the only way to work and it's not the only way to build relationships. Um, and plenty of it is, right? Like mm -hmm. all those connections we make at APAC, it's the emails we send. Um, it's a number of different things, but more so than whether or not you need to have it. I think like clarity about your reason and clarity about your approach are important because it should add to your experience. And mm -hmm. I feel like that was a lot of uh, my takeaways recently. I was on TikTok uh, like a year and a half ago where I was doing videos like almost daily, basically just putting out, putting out content and it exhausted me so much that I just took a three-year break mm. or not a three-year break, a one-year break mm. from posting anything really on TikTok. And additionally, I just did a countdown to like my three-year narrator versary and posted a handful of videos. Um, and those were really fun to make. And I also realized that th they set a precedent that I didn't necessarily want to keep meeting. Right. Mm. Um, and so I think the content that I make where I'm just like, oh, I'm inspired to kind of do this right now. Like, here's a thought and I'm just going to do it. That I think brings me joy and honestly, like takes less time to mm -hmm. ultimately uh, to generate. Um, and and really that's, that's what I would prefer, right? Mm -hmm. I, if I'm going to do something that's like going to be stressful and is maybe going to increase my work by like, five percent or something i don't know that that's necessarily going to be worth it mm. as opposed to having a relationship with social media that's about like your own discovery of the platform and your own relationship to content mm. um but i think ultimately for me like i i don't think i'm going to make a lot of audiobook related content in the future it's not really the stuff that like makes me makes me want to get up in the morning or whatever it is <laughs> um but I, yeah i think everyone should explore that for themselves for sure yeah well, first of all i think i think that's a wonderful answer uh and there are so many nuggets there um that i just know that people are gonna take great value from i feel i re i resonate with that a lot i did try and i there was a point where i was making like at least four videos a week um mm -hmm. and it sounds like we went through a similar situation mine happened very recently where it's just like i just like had woke up one day and had no interest in posting yeah. on social media and i decided to take a month off and then i tried to come back and again it's sort of fell off and i just was like what am i trying to do what i don't really want to you know i'm not a coach or anything i i'm not i'm not making that kind of content and you know i just had this like 
don't want to say breakdown because it sound that's not what it was, but it was very much like a, a loss of interest yeah. um, in doing that. And uh, truthfully, I'm I'm at that stage right now where is I'm thinking, well, you have to put something out because one, people are going to be thinking that you're not doing anything, or mm. how do you expect people to find you if you're not putting stuff out there? So I'm having all those thoughts, um, and that's those thoughts are battling against very childish me going but i just don't want to <laughs> you know so it's yeah i it's a really tricky one it's something that i struggle with on the daily yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I recently had a conversation with someone about uh and they jokingly said essentially like you know we're on social media and we're like posting that we just got booked uh, that we just got cast in something we're posting when a review comes out we're posting for all these contents and they said like plumbers aren't like taking selfies at the houses of their clients being like, just booked a new, just booked a new plumbing job. Um, and, and you know, there's a lot that's different about acting for sure. And they have their own mediums of advertising and keeping mm -hmm. clients. And I guess that's to say that's, that conversation was really impactful for me. And it's been spurring a lot of change in how I approach social media. Um, because I, there's a lot of things that I do love. I do love, I have my own background in like video editing and I'm a Gen Zer who likes TikTok. Like I do like making videos. And I also feel like sometimes it feels like the approach that I have on Instagram or on TikTok or where be it felt feels like it's hard for it to not feel so ego driven sometimes. Mm -hmm. And it's hard for it to not feel like it's not going to be sustainable, right? There were things that I did like posting every time a release came out um, before I went full time that I'm still right now doing, but that I'm like ready to let go of mm -hmm. because I think that like there are forms of celebration and there are forms of communities hyping each other up that are really fantastic for new narrators. And I think that like, for me now, like it feels like, okay, I'm working regularly. I'm doing all these things. I think like the frequency of this feels like it is becoming about me and it's becoming about like a weekly celebration of me. Yeah. And I think that's like not terrible. I don't think it's terrible to celebrate yourself, but I think that like I really wanted to start celebrating the authors involved. I wanted to celebrate the directors I got to work with. I wanted to celebrate like my co-narrators. I wanted to kind of do all these other things. And so, you know, recently, like this month, um, I would make these videos when a new book came out um, and it would be either me or me and my co-narrators on there. Um, and I've started adding the authors onto the image as well and started, you know, like tagging in, um, whoever the editor was tagging the editor on the project as well, whoever did my pickups. Um, I think just trying to like, one, recognize that it was a team effort and two, like celebrate audiobooks more so than just me, if that makes sense. Mm. Um, I feel like, I feel like we're, I think a lot of the practices that we have are structured and created for people who are, afraid to celebrate themselves. And I think my personal truth is that that isn't fully me necessarily. And so I think it became inauthentic for me. Hmm. And so I've been trying to shift like what I do on social media, why I'm there, what's the point of posting and hoping that it'll be more connective, collaborative, less of an opportunity to say like, like, yeah, I'm working, like I'm still working and more of an opportunity to be like, I loved doing this because like they wrote an amazing book or like I felt really connected to this performance and it was thanks to like this director helping helping keep me grounded or, you know, mm -hmm. whatever it is. This next question may not be, doesn't have to be about audiobooks, doesn't have to be about voice acting, doesn't have to be about being in the booth. But what are your what are your non-negotiables? What comes to mind when I say that? What 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 is absolute non-negotiables for you? When I was in college, um, there was a staff member I became friends with, um, really fantastic woman, and she just had this 
completely quirky personality, you know, like no one who meets her forgets her. Mm -hmm. And we were in the dining hall uh, at one point. She was sitting with us, uh, me and a group of people. And she just looks at us and she goes like, okay, like, I think I'm done. Like, I'm going to go sit with someone else now. Like, y'all have fun. And just got up and left. And I joked with her later and I was like, you know, Valerie, I really want to be like you when I grow up. And she's like, why wait? Like, why not do it now? And I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, you're right. And I feel like um, that has become something uh, essentially non-negotiable for me that I try to like experience in my life is, is getting the thing I fundamentally need now or acknowledging what is within my reach and working towards that. I think for me that drives uh, relationships. Mm -hmm. I, if I'm excited to be friends with someone, I don't want to like play it cool and like, yeah, like call me like, oh my God, like let's, let's hang out. Like, let yeah, let's go do this. Like I've got this event coming up. Like, let's go do it. Um, it feels like it was part of what drove me into audiobooks that I ran into ACX and someone was like, here's the three things you got to buy from B and H. And then I bought that and dove in and it feels like, um, Ultimately, uh, it's helping me navigate my time as a narrator as well. Mm. I think that, you know, I'm I'm on a journey to uh, work towards like a, a rate that I like in audiobooks. And similarly, like I said, I, I do prefer working in studio. I prefer working with a director. And so asking for that as often as possible. And so I think for me, there's like a matrix or a balance sheet, essentially, of those three things when I'm thinking about work. And, you know, so if they're not able to meet my rate, but they're able to put me in studio or they're able to meet my rate, but there is no director or whatever it is, I think like trying to navigate that has n less been a process of like, sure, like whatever you got, I'll just take it mm -hmm. because, you know, I, I need to work whatever it is. And more of a process of like, okay, let me sit down and think about this. And do I actually want to do this book? Like, is this book actually something that I, that's going to bring me joy that I want mm -hmm. in my portfolio? Um, and I feel like the outcome of that has been, I don't think I can think of a book that I regretted narrating. Mm -hmm. Or I think there are folks who are like, ah, oh, like, you know. There's some there's some stuff that's like really not well written that you just got to you do it to fill your schedule and you chug on. And I feel really fortunate that I don't feel like I've had books like that in my portfolio. I don't know what all of the implications for that are going to be across my life moving mm -hmm. forward. Um, but I do want to, I think, like feel that I'm working at my worth and feel that I am connecting with people in a way that matters and feel that I'm choosing paths that are like i said going to bring me joy mm -hmm. um because i don't really want to spend a lot of time i think like running in circles doing things that aren't like moving me forward or doing things that aren't next version of andre there is i love that i love that answer so much um and i just know how valuable that is going to be to not only uh, the listeners, but myself <laughs> included there. Um, I'd love to uh, end the show uh, by simply asking if there's anything that you're working on right now that is bringing you excitement. I mentioned um, the words that remain that I recorded this month. That That's coming out tomorrow, so it'll be out by the time this podcast releases. Um, adored that performance. The book I cannot stop thinking about um, that... I'll, I'll share two. One is uh, called Sito, um, S-I-T-O, and it's coming out in February. I, When I started narrating, I thought I was never going to do nonfiction. I didn't think there was anything in nonfiction for me. And I've just been surprised over and over again. And this book has like taken the cake. Um, it is about a teen uh, teenager in San Francisco who who witnesses at first and is, uh, you know, initially charged with a gang related murder. And then a few years later dies in a gang related murder. And uh, the author is a professor of urban violence and he navigates 
this essentially writes a biography of this this um you know this boy's life with so much thoughtfulness and care and his wife the author's wife is a professor of um religious studies and she uh, teaches a lot about santeria and so there's all these like yoruba legends and stories woven in that help us kind of identify where people are emotionally and it's this like reassessment of justice and vengeance and i think it is whether or not i had narrated it i think it is the most beautiful book i've ever read wow. um, and i cannot stop thinking about it um so that's coming out in february and then all the way on the other end of the spectrum i just started my first lit rpg series and it is a blast and the first book is coming out in february it's called uh rogue ascension and we're already buckled down for I'll say we're buckled down for three books at the very least. Um, but it just activates all the parts in my brain that anime does. And I'm loving it so much. And I did not know lit RPG was this fun. And <laughs> uh, yes, I, and that's what I love about audiobooks. Yeah. It's like, you don't know what you're going to get, but it's going to be a great time. <laughs> Well, both of those projects sound amazing. And uh, uh, for those listening, please make sure to check the uh, show notes because uh, those projects will be uh, linked uh, here, there so that you can check those out. Um, well, that brings us to a close for this episode of the Audiobook Club. Uh, all of the links to Andre's social media platforms and website will be linked in the show notes. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in, uh, tuning in. And of course, another huge, huge, huge thank you to you, Andre, for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. Frustrated by the royalty rates for your audiobook? Annoyed that when the digital distributors say 70% royalties, they actually mean 70% of 50% or 80% of 70%, neither of which is an actual 70%. Wishing there was a way to cut out the middleman? Yet, you want your audiobook listeners to have a smooth and positive experience and a direct download sale from your website won't deliver that. We at Pro Audio Voices hear you. Out of our commitment to our author clients, we've created Amplify, a program that provides an actual 65% of the sales price that you set, that gives you access to your customers' names and emails so you can reconnect with them, and keeps you in the driver's seat. Check it out at ProAudioVoices.com. You'll find Amplify in the marketing menu.